Hi everyone, my name is Amy Lin and I'm a third year medical student at Emory School of Medicine. I am very excited to be presenting on the eye and diabetes mellitus. So our objectives today are to understand how diabetes affects the eye, to learn the clinical presentation of diabetic retinopathy, which I will abbreviate as DR, and to identify characteristic fundoscopic findings of DR. Now, in order to understand how diabetes affects the eye, let's briefly review some important diabetes mellitus concepts. DM is divided into two types. Type 1 is characterized by the autoimmune destruction of insulin-producing pancreatic beta cells, while type 2 involves dysregulation of glucose homeostasis, leading to decreased peripheral glucose uptake and abnormal pancreatic beta cell function. Both type 1 and type 2 cause increased blood glucose levels. Now, chronic hyperglycemia causes cell damage to various organs through several mechanisms. Those that are especially pertinent to the eye are osmotic endothelial damage from intracellular sorbitol accumulation, microvascular changes via formation of advanced glycation products, or AGEs, and increased production of and susceptibility to reactive oxygen species. In the eye, chronic hyperglycemia primarily affects the retina's dense vasculature, which supplies nutrients and oxygen to the complex network of specialized neural cells that process and transmit visual information to the brain via the optic nerve. This hyperglycemia-induced damage leads to microvascular wall weakening and ischemia, which ultimately causes visual deficits. We will talk about the characteristic fundoscopic findings later on. So as a quick overview, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in people with diabetes. Around 75% of those who have had DM for more than 15 years will have some degree of DR. It is also important to note that good glycemic control, which is maintaining a hemoglobin A1c below 7%, will delay the onset of retinopathy. DR has four stages. Stage 1 through stage 3 delineates the progressive stages of severity in non-proliferative DR, abbreviated as NPDR. Then we come to stage 4, which is termed proliferative diabetic retinopathy, can be abbreviated as PDR, and the key difference from the non-proliferative stages is the presence of VEGF-induced new blood vessel growth, secondary to retinal ischemia. Now let's go through two brief cases to demonstrate the clinical presentation of the two types of diabetic retinopathy. In case one, we have a 53-year-old man with a past medical history of DM for 10 years and hypertension who presents with spots of blurry vision. It is important when taking this patient's history to ask about whether they have experienced any symptoms of constant or intermittent reduced vision, floaters, photopsia, or visual field defects. It is also important to ask about their hemoglobin A1c level. Additionally, in this patient's workup, we want to ask about any medications they are taking to treat their diabetes and whether they are adherent, as well as whether their blood pressure is under control. Once we have elicited a pertinent history, we will need to perform a slit lamp and dilated fundus exam. When looking at the back of the eye on a fundus exam, here is what we normally see in a healthy eye. We have the optic disc, the macula, which is important in our central vision and is the area of the eye with the highest visual acuity, and here we have some normal retinal vessels. Conversely, here is the fundus photo for our 53-year-old male patient with blurry vision. For this patient, one can appreciate microaneurysms caused by microvascular compromise and the presence of hard exudates, which are lipid residues of serous leakage from damaged vessels. The same patient may also have cotton wool spots, which develop secondary to retinal arterial obstruction, causing ischemic damage to the retinal nerve fiber layer. Now these findings can actually be seen in both NPDR and PDR. Now in case two, our patient is a 65-year-old woman with a past medical history of uncontrolled DM for 20 years, hypertension and coronary artery disease, who presents with seeing spots, and blurry vision. After taking a good history, we move into the physical exam, and here is her fundus photo. 
Here we can also appreciate hard exudates. But what differentiates this fundus photo from that of the previous case is the presence of abnormal new blood vessel growth. Now this is characteristic of PDR. Other findings seen in PDR include vitreous hemorrhages, as well as these boat-shaped preretinal hemorrhages labeled here by the asterisk. Diagnostic procedures useful in determining the severity of diabetic retinopathy are ocular coherence tomography, abbreviated as OCT, and fluorescein angiography. Since fluorescein angiography requires IV contrast, OCT is more commonly used. Now the progression of non-proliferative DR can be delayed through rigorous blood glucose and blood pressure control with no direct intervention if macular edema is not significant. However, non-proliferative DR in combination with extensive macular edema can be treated with focal laser, intravitreal steroids, and anti-VEGF agents. If a diagnosis of proliferative DR is made, there are various options to directly treat, including laser therapy, also called panretinal photocoagulation, anti-VEGF injections, and vitrectomy. Now, in terms of screening, the AO recommendations for type 1 diabetes are annual screenings for DR beginning five years after onset of disease. For type 2 diabetes, the patient would be examined for DR at the time of diagnosis and then annual exams thereafter. All right, so to summarize, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus damages the retina in the setting of chronic hyperglycemia, but always keep in mind that hypertension may expedite the disease progression. Furthermore, diabetic retinopathy is divided into non-proliferative and proliferative types, with the major difference being the presence of new vessel growth seen in proliferative type. Patients with mild to moderate NPDR may be asymptomatic, which underlines the importance of routine screening, or they may experience blurry vision secondary to macular edema. Patients with PDR, on the other hand, may present with visual deficits like visual field defects, perception of floaters, or flashing lights, which may be indicative of retinal detachment and is a medical emergency. More milder presentations include blurry vision. Remember that common fundoscopic findings for both NPDR and PDR include microaneurysms, retinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, and hard exudates. Thank you so much for watching this presentation and I hope you enjoyed it.